right, take your Bible this morning, if you would please, to go to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11, please. We are going to read the first 11 verses of Judges chapter 11. We read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2, and we alternate reading until we end together on verse 11 of Judges chapter 11. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin on verse 1 of Judges 11. Ready? Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman." Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, Come, be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me, and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now, when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us, and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words." Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of your scripture this morning. And Father, as we begin to focus our attention on your word today, I pray, God, again, that you would quiet each of our hearts. Each of us would understand what it means to be still and know that you are God. So, Lord, help us and still our hearts and our minds that we might focus upon your word this morning. I pray you'll bless the special now and that it will put our heart to be in tune with your heart. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.
Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now and we ask you to minister to our hearts this morning. I want to thank you for the Bible and for the opportunity we have to open it together today. And I pray, Lord, the Word of God will accomplish what you would want it to accomplish in each one of our hearts and lives. So, Lord, help me as I bring the message today and give me clarity of mind and thought. Please help each individual as they listen today. I pray it will be a, a help. I pray it will be an encouragement. I pray it will be a challenge to each and every individual listening today. May each of us have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this morning through your word. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. At the death of Joshua, over a period of about 300 years, God raised up 12 men and one woman to rule Israel. They ruled and they judged for God, usually to deliver Israel out of oppression from another group of people. They were called judges. Largely, these 300 years were years of idolatry, apostasy, and immorality. In fact, the key verse in all the book of Judges is at the end of the book, in Judges 21 and verse 25, where it says, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That was the time period that we're looking at when we read the book of Judges. So every man would do what's right in his own eyes. They'd turn from God. And by the way, that's how every one of us go astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We just do what we want to do. And whenever we do what we want to do, instead of what God tells us to do, we go astray. And so that's where Israel was. The judge would, God would raise up a judge. He would deliver the people. The people would make promises and return to God, only to last for a short time. And then the cycle would repeat itself, and they'd go back into idolatry and apostasy and immorality, and then God would raise up a deliverer. And that process just continues to repeat as you read through the book of Judges. And here in Judges 11, the group that has risen up to threaten the Israelites at this time was a group called the Ammonites. And so they now cry for a deliverer. And the deliverer they go to is a man named Jephthah. We're introduced to him in the first verse of Judges 11. The name Jephthah means God opens. Notice what it says about Jephthah in verse 1. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. That means he was a mighty man of strength. It means he was a mighty man of character. It means he was a mighty man of war. He was a mighty man of dignity. Now all that involves in him being a mighty man of valor. One night, his father, because every man's doing what's right in his own eyes, goes out on his own, 
and gets together with a harlot. As a result of that night, Jephthah is born. His father, apparently, made things right with his wife. and She stayed married to him and she forgave him. They kept the marriage and the family together. In fact, they even had additional children. But as the boys grew up, the other boys in the family, and they began to put two and two together. They realized that Jephthah's not their real brother. Oh, he's, they share the same father, but they don't share the same mother. And they decide he's not going to get our inheritance as the firstborn of the family. Because he's not really the family, he's the son of a harlot. And so they begin to kick him out. And they do kick him out. The Bible says that when his wife's sons grew up, they thrust out Jephthah, verse 2, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. So they kicked him out and he goes to this land of Tob and years go by. Jephthah is there. When it says vain men, vain simply means empty-headed men. He didn't have a real good crowd he's hanging around. He didn't have a real good group that he was with. But as the years go by, Israel is threatened by the Ammonites. And when they're threatened by the Ammonites, they're looking for a deliverer. And, and they cannot think of anybody with the valor, the character, the dignity, the strength of Jephthah. And so they go to the land of Tob to get Jephthah to ask him, to come be their deliverer. Come and lead them in the battle against the Ammonites and deliver them. They convince him to do just that. Jephthah comes. He does give them victory over the Ammonites. And he judges Israel for six years. Jephthah was a great man of God. When you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and God has His hall of faith in Hebrews 11, guess who's listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11? Jephthah. Now, if I, if I had this morning, you just called it out and said, start listing me some people in Hebrews 11, we probably would have went a long time before somebody said Jephthah. But Jephthah is listed there underneath. I mean, he's listed in there with David and, and Joshua and Abraham and Isaac and, and, and Moses. He's listed among some great, great men of God. I want you to notice, Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. Are you listening? But his mother was a harlot. If you'd asked Jephthah growing up, who his mother was, he'd have told you, I don't know who she is. He probably didn't know. His half-brothers and his father and his stepmother kicked him out of the house at some age. It doesn't say what, how old they were. He went out to live in a city where he didn't know anybody and they didn't know him. He had the wrong crowd try to influence him bunch of empty-headed guys, vain fellows. But Jephthah became a mighty man of valor. So much so when Israel needed to deliver, there was no one they could find that they, they could look at and say, he doesn't rise to the level of Jephthah. If we want a man of courage and a man of character and a man of integrity and a man of decency and a man of strength and a man of godliness, let's go get Jephthah. I want you to listen to me this morning. 
It does not matter this morning if you don't know who your mother or your father was. Or is. It does not matter this morning if you do not know, or if your family this morning has made you an outcast. It does not matter this morning if you're in a strange place with people you don't know. It does not matter what your situation or your circumstances are, you still have a responsibility to serve God and to be honest and to have integrity and to do what God wants you to do. You say, why do you talk that way, Pastor? Because we have too many today that hide behind excuses why they don't do what they know they ought to do for God. Why they don't live as they ought to live for God. They hide behind past experiences or they hide behind past circumstances in their lives. Well, my dad was an alcoholic, so this is why I am the way I am. Or my mom never spent time with me, and that's why I am this way. Or my family wasn't very loving. Or my parents moved around a lot. Or my dad never was, went to church. Or in my case, my dad took me to too many Cleveland Indians games. That's why I am the way I am. I mean, you, you name it, and, and somebody's got an excuse as to why they're living the way they're living. And why they are the way they are. Well, uh, they, they were abusive, or this happened in my life, so that's why I'm a drug addict, or that's why I do this, or that's why I do that. And everybody has an excuse or an experience that they want to hide behind. Jephthah could have done that too. But he did not. He did not. Jephthah tells us that it doesn't matter what your mom did or didn't do, or whether your dad did or didn't do. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. You live right. You live for God. You love God with all your heart. It doesn't matter if your family's loving or not. You can be loving. It doesn't matter if your parents were divorced or not. You can have a loving, dedicated marriage. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, so then every one of us will give account of himself to God. When you stand before God one day, you're not going to say, well, my dad or my mom or well, my uncle or my family or my... You're going to give account of yourself to God. It's going to be you and God. And you'll give account for yourself. You won't hide behind anything else or anyone else. Jephthah said, Jephthah said, my mom's a harlot. My family doesn't want me. They kicked me out. I have no inheritance. I have no family. I'm in a strange land. But I'm still going to live for God. I'm still going to do as God wants me to do. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to have integrity and I'm going to have honesty and I'm going to have decency and I'm going to be a man of strength and I'm going to be a man of character and I'm going to live for God. But he's not the only one you see that in the Bible. Joseph was that way. Somebody else who got thrown out of his house. Joseph's brothers got rid of him. At first, thinking they might kill him, leaving him in a pit. Finally selling him into slavery. And eventually, those slave traders took him to Egypt. Here he is, rejected by his family, over 500 miles from home, in a strange land where he doesn't know anybody. Well, Joseph, you're going to have some emotional scars that will just stay with you forever. You poor thing. We need to write you a prescription. That's, that's where he'd be today. Listen to me now. Don't, don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. Okay? I know you're going to enjoy this. I know you are. What I'm talking about this morning is who's in control anyway? Who is in control anyway? Joseph. <laughs> Brothers hate you. Sold as a slave. 500 miles from home. You understand, 500 miles from home for us is nothing. 
It's a, it's a two-hour plane flight. 500, five, 500 miles from home by camel, you're, you're quite a ways away. You don't want to travel that. Or by wagon. <laughs> That's a long way. And now on top of that, he gets there and he, he starts uh, serving Pharaoh Potiphar, Pharaoh's uh, uh, captain there, and, and, and he's doing everything he could. In fact, he rises up to where anything that's done, he's in charge of it. Then what happens? Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him. She, she gets her eyes set on him and, and makes advances towards him and finally he finds himself in a bad situation where he's the only one in the house with her and she, she comes after him and he, he runs. And she grabs his coat and then she screams and tells everybody, he tried to attack me. Now who are they going to believe? A Hebrew slave? Or Potiphar's wife? No contest. There wasn't even a trial. He's thrown in prison. Now he's going to be a felon. Now he's got a criminal record. Well, certainly, he better be on suicide watch in prison, shouldn't he? I mean, this boy is going to have some real problems in life. He certainly uh, is, is going to have to be watched and, and cared for. But it's not over. He gets in the prison and... There's two people in prison there. A butler and a baker of Pharaoh. They both have a dream. They can't figure out what it is. But God reveals to Joseph what the dreams are. And He tells them, He tells the, I think it's the baker, isn't it? He says, you're going you're gonna to die. But the butler, He says, you're going to get released and get restored to your position. Oh, and the butler, oh man, thank you, thank you. I won't forget you. Man, I'll remember you when I get out. I, don't worry, I got your back, man. I'm going to put a good word in for you. And so it happened just exactly as God revealed it to Joseph. The baker's killed, the butler gets released, and he's back in Pharaoh's palace. And guess what? He forgets all about it. So next time we see Joseph, he's just smoking marijuana trying to get by it. No, he's not. I've got to deal with this. I've been rejected by my brothers and rejected and falsely accused and now I'm in prison and now this guy, I can't trust anybody. I can't deal with all this. There's too much pressure. Joseph, you're bound to have some personality problems. Joseph, you're bound to have some social issues. Joseph, you're going to struggle with a low self-esteem. You know what? Joseph didn't know anything about that. Joseph just said, I'm going to serve God anyway. I'm going to just serve God anyway. And the truth is, Joseph became the most decent, upright, honorable, godly man in all the land of Egypt. Listen, listen carefully. You will either use the circumstances of your life as a stepping stone or a stumbling block. But you will decide. You will decide. Look at Genesis chapter 45. Turn back there, will you please? Genesis chapter 45. Joseph is going to reveal himself to his brothers in Genesis 45. Notice with me verse 1, please. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Joseph said unto his brethren, I'm Joseph. 
Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye did send me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. You know what Joseph is saying? Fellas, don't you be angry about it. You didn't put me in the pit. You didn't sell me to slavery. You didn't send me here to Egypt. God did. God did all that. Who's in control? God is. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there be neither earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And He made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. How did Joseph get to Egypt? God. Why was he why was he thrown in prison? God. God was preparing him for what he had for him to do. I don't know what you've been through in life. You don't know all that I've been through in life, but I'll guarantee you this, God you God will use it to prepare you to be able to serve Him and fulfill the purpose for which He created you. And and listen, you don't know what that is and you may not be experiencing that yet, but you'll either use the experience that God has put you through as a stepping stone to serving Him or you use it as a stumbling block to never do anything for God. Joseph says, I'm going to use it for God's glory. Turn over to the last book of Genesis, the last chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50. He said, Well, preacher, you don't know what happened to me. You don't know what was done to me. It wasn't good. Well, Genesis 50 20 is the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament. And that's where Joseph says this, but as for you, talking to his brothers, ye thought evil against me. But God, aren't you glad when God butts in? But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass it is this day to save much people alive. Now, how can he say that? He can say verse 20 because of verse 19. Don't pass over verse 19. Notice what he said in verse 19. Joseph said unto them, that's his brothers, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. You know why? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He said, because I'm looking at it the way God looks at it. Not the way I see it. If I do it, if I determine whether what's happened to me is good or bad, I'm taking the place of God. We talked about it in Sunday school. Oh, the devil said, Adam and Eve, you eat of the tree. How come God's the only one that can say what's good and what's evil? You should be able to determine what's good and what's evil. Up until that point, Adam and Eve never had to consider that. They just left all that in God's hands. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I think, I think Jesus come as we get saved and we receive Him as our Savior... He restores that which was lost, that relationship with God, where we leave good and evil to Him, not to us. 
You ever had anything happen in your life and you said to yourself, oh, this is bad. Really? Can we determine that? I've lived long enough now. I realize I'm still very young. But <laughs> my gray hair betrays me. But I, I've lived long enough now to know there's things I look back on that I thought were bad then that I look back now and say, you know what? That was really good. Amen. That was a good thing. I don't determine good and evil. That's God's department. Who's in control? Charles Colson is a name that you might be familiar with. Charles Colson, some of you older folks will remember, was an attorney for Richard Nixon. <clears throat> he was part of the Watergate scandal in 1972. He went to jail, seven month sentence. But prior to going to jail through the witness of another person, he came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And in prison, he began to get involved with some Bible studies with prisoners. And in prison, God began to burden his heart about those men behind the bars. For somebody to minister to them, and through that time of Bible study, prison fellowship was birthed. And prison fellowship now ministers to over 100,000 prisoners across the United States. And actually they're in over 100 foreign countries as well. An amazing ministry that's happened. Now you look back and say, oh, how bad it was you went to prison. And Charles Colson, who's in heaven now, would have said, oh no, that wasn't bad that was the best thing that ever happened to me. All depends on who's in control. If I'm in control of my life, I say, yeah, that's horrible. If I'm in control of my life and my brothers try to kill me or sell me off and get me out of the house, I say, that's an awful thing. But I'm not in control. God is. I don't write the story of my life. God does. God, though, though things can be meant for evil, God can mean them for good. Most of you know the story of Ron Hamilton and Patch the Pirate. How that all came about with a tumor in his eye. And he has to have surgery to remove the tumor and they don't know if they'll save the eye or not. He won't know whether he loses his eye until he comes out of surgery. He come out of surgery without an eye. He was at church several weeks later and he had a patch over his eye. And it was a little boy who come up and asked what that was. He said, that's a patch. And the little boy said, well, you look like a pirate. And he said, well, I guess I, guess I, I, guess I am. I guess I'm Patch the Pirate. And that's how that came about. And now, uh, there's some of you in your probably in your 30s that have grew up with Patch the Pirate. Now you're playing it for your kids or your grandkids. How many, how many thousands, maybe millions of children have been influenced by Patch the Pirate? Oh, how awful you lost your eye. I think Ron Hamilton would say, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Fanny Crosby, who was blinded by the mistake of a doctor at six months of age and lost her sight, had to go through all of her life without ever seeing. But she wrote over 3,000 hymns and gospel songs. And she said, I thank God I was blinded and I've been unable to see. I never would have written the songs I did. And the first face I'll ever see will be the face of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul 
after his conversion, Saul at the time on the road to Damascus. You remember when he got into Damascus and after three days with Ananias, he, he was baptized. And then he began to preach. He began to preach the Christ that he used to try to destroy. And what happened in Damascus? A band of men got together and decided, we're going to kill him. They had to let him down over the wall by night in a basket to escape. Boy, that's, that's a great way to start your Christian life, isn't it? Well, the great thing that is, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to meet Peter and John and, and Andrew. The, the disciples are there. How cool is that? And he gets to Jerusalem and the Bible says he is saved. He tried to join himself to disciples and guess what? They didn't want anything to do with him. I mean, how would you like it if you got saved and you're excited and you, you go into the church and you walk in the door and they say, uh, you're not welcome here. Huh? No, 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 I've been saved. Yeah, sure, sure. It's okay. Wow. Well, Saul, you're going to have some emotional instability now, of course. You're going to have some real scarring from this, the way people treat you. What a start to your Christian life. You ever think about that? Talk about, talk about Satan hitting hard at somebody trying to stop them before they even start. And by the way, new Christian, if you're a new Christian here today, that, that, that Satan will do the same to you. He'd like to stop you as early in the race as he possibly can. So understand that. In fact, take your Bible and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Would you turn over there please? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here is Paul's, now, now he's been saved a while, he's served God with his life, and he's telling the church at Corinth his experience in the ministry, his experience is serving Christ. He said in verse 23 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, are they ministers of Christ? And then he lets us know, I speak as a fool, I am more. And here's what he says he's been through. Are you ready? In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Five times he received the cat of nine tails. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. He was stoned, by the way, and left for dead. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings, often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. Weariness, yeah. Painfulness, yes. Watchings often in hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness. And beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. But you know what Paul said? Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory... I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. And when you read what he's been through in his Christian life, if, if you just read that list and then somebody said to you, wouldn't you like to be a Christian? Wouldn't you like to follow Jesus? You just said, I, I don't know I want to sign up for that. Saul had all the reasons in the world to have an excuse not to serve God. But he kept on going. He, just like Daniel, purposed in his heart. 
He, like Job, said, Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. The Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. All any of us really deserve would be to die and be punished in hell for our sin. Anything above that is God's grace to you and me. God's favor upon our life. And yet we get so upset if even the smallest thing goes wrong. Or we get mistreated in some way. Let alone get thrown in prison. Let alone get beat up. Let alone have to suffer some hunger and thirst for Christ. The songwriter said, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to gain the prize and sailed through bloody seas? No, I must fight if I would win. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by Thy Word. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. You have to come to that point. That point where you say, you know what? No matter what my father did or mother did or no matter what happened to me or hasn't happened to me, whether I have a broken home or a good home, whether it's drinking my home or no drinking in my home, whether it's abuse in my home or no abuse in my home, whether I had a good childhood or a horrible childhood, no matter whether I watched others fall and turn back or whether nobody fell and turned back, I'm purposing in my heart to serve God. I'm purposing in my heart, I'll be a man of valor, I'll be a woman of valor, I'll be a woman who serves God, I'll give account of myself to God one day, I can't hide behind anything else, anything that's happened in my life, I'm going to believe, though it might have been evil, God meant it for good. And God will use it for good in my life. And I'm going to keep serving God anyway. Can I help you with something? Nobody has a perfect past. Nobody has a perfect past. And nobody has a perfect present. You have no idea. You have no idea what other people are going through this morning. I know sometimes you come to church and you look at other people and you think, boy, if I just had their life. Sometimes people sit in my office and they'll mention some other couple and they'll say, boy, if we were just like so-and-so. And boy, I know things that they don't know. And I want to say, I want to say, and I don't. I just want to say, you have no idea. You have no idea. I really believe this. I really believe that if, if you, you could come up to the altar and lay all your problems on the altar, every single person. And once you saw all the problems up here of everybody else, you'd come up and take your own back and say, I think I'll just keep what I have. Nobody has it better than you do. Everybody has problems. Everybody has things in their life that aren't right, that aren't perfect. That aren't, aren't oh, I just had that. Boy, they just got all their ducks in a row. You don't have any idea. You know what? The people in the room today that are serving God and being faithful to Him are people who have said what's happened has happened. I cannot do anything about it. I can do what goes on from this point forward. I can can be faithful to God from this point on. I'll not use it as an excuse to be less than what I ought to be for God. Doesn't matter what took place, I'll live for God. Doesn't matter who hurt me, I'm going to live for God. It does not matter where I came from, I'm going to live for God. It doesn't matter who has rejected me, I'm going to live for God. Doesn't matter about my past mistakes, I will live for God. I won't hide behind anything or any excuses. I'll be a Jephthah. I'll be a Joseph. I'll be a a, a Ron Hamilton. I'll be a Chuck Colson. I'll be a Fanny Crosby. I'll be the Apostle Paul. Because if you'll be 
what you ought to be. God will give you opportunity to do what He wants you to do. But you'll never get to do what He wants you to do if you won't be what He wants you to be. I'm telling you this morning, your background, your circumstances, your environment are no excuse not to serve God with your life. Be a Jephthah. He was a mighty man of valor, but his mother was a harlot. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this morning. Lord, I pray you'll take the truth from your word, the lives of the men that we've looked at today. You'll use it to help people in this room this morning. Those who may have been watching by way of the internet. We need this message in America today. But there's people in this room who need this message. And I pray, dear Lord, you'll help us to take the circumstances of life and use them as a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. Let me ask you this morning. I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, if if I died this morning, I, I know for sure I'd go to heaven. By that I, I mean I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm not trusting anything I do. I'm trusting what Jesus has done for me. There's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner. And I knew I needed a Savior. And I knew Jesus was a Savior I needed. And I placed my faith in Him as my Savior. And Pastor, I know if I got a sharp pain in my chest this morning and I didn't take another breath... My next breath would be in heaven. I'm confident of that. If that's your situation, you say, Pastor, here's my hand. I know that I'm saved. Would you slip it up for a moment and hold it that I may see it? Just say, I know that I'm saved, Pastor. All right, you may put them down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that. I don't have that confidence that if I took my last breath here, my next breath would be in heaven. Would you let me pray for you this morning? I'm not going to call you out or point you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up right now and say, Pastor, pray for me today? Is there someone like that? God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. Thank you this morning. You may put them down. How many believers here this morning would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart today. Truth is, I've been kind of using some of those excuses as to why I don't do some of the things I know that I should do for God. Not living the way I ought to live for the Lord because I do hide behind some of those excuses you talked about today, Pastor. But the Spirit of God spoke to my heart today. And today I'm no longer going to use the past experiences or the present experiences as a stumbling block. I'll use them as a stepping stone. I'm going to serve God with my life. I'll not use any excuses. Preacher, God spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray. We'll have our invitation. Listen very carefully. If you're here today and you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. Not sure that... You have eternal life. I'm going to pray. and When I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. When we stand to our feet, our pianist will begin to play an invitation hymn. As soon as she begins to play the note on the piano, Christians are going to come and pray at the altar. Why don't you slip from your seat? Come down here to the front. Someone will take you aside privately. Let us show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that when you die, you'll go to heaven. Don't, don't walk out the door without knowing that. As soon as that piano plays, you slip from your seat and you come. Christian, 
God has spoken to your heart. You respond to God this morning, will you please? Heavenly Father, bless this invitation time. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. And I would simply ask you, God, that each individual now would do what you're telling them to do in their heart. That each of us would be obedient to you and holy decisions be made for thee this morning. Have your way in this invitation time, and I'll thank you for it.